Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gamer Reviews. This series is dedicated to reviewing different products, miniatures, rules, and game systems dedicated to miniatures wargaming. And on today's episode, we are continuing on with our book review for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle that's been published by the Warhammer Armies Project. Uh, that was of course written up by uh, Matthias Eliasson. So today, the army book that we'll be looking at today is the 9th edition rules for vampire accounts for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now, in this video, of course, we'll talk about the different army rules for the different units. We'll also talk about their magic items as well as spells. We'll address some of the special characters that they have as well, as well as our army lists. And as we go through it, we will compare some of the good, the bad, the positive, the negative with some of these addition changes that have taken place. Now, this video will be significantly longer than my usual videos. And the reason why is because we're taking an in-depth look at the book and the materials and the rules that are written. So if you want to see a very specific piece of information in this video, I will put timestamps down in the description below so that way you can click on the section that is most pertinent to you. So that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this docker real quick. Once again, this is from the Warhammer Armies Project, which is a blogger site that is run by Matthias Eliasson. Uh, Matthias Eliasson has basically written up rules for different factions for Warhammer Fantasy Battle that never got an army book of their own. Armies like Albion, Cathay, and the Kingdom of Ind, for example. And he wrote those rules up for 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. He has also taken upon himself to create a 9th edition of Warhammer Fantasy, and at the same time, he has written army books for all the factions within that setting as well. So, Games Workshop can actually definitely take a page out of this guy's book and learn how to do army rules like you're supposed to, so he's doing a very good job there as well. So as you can see, this document is a PDF that you can download for free from his website, and it's also professionally done. As you can see, he's got artwork inside of it, as well as desktop publishing on it, as well as lots of information. In fact, if you didn't know any better, you could actually swear this was actually an official document. That's how high quality it really is. So first of all, we're going to start off with the Undying Horde rules. We'll go through all the different units as well as that is presented for the new update for Vampire Counts. We'll then talk about special characters as well as spell and magical items. And then of course we'll talk about the army list and give our overall review for it. So first of all, let's go ahead and click on the Undying Horde rules here real fast and let's go ahead and talk about that. So first of all, let's talk about the army special rules on this one. So first of all, of course, Almost all units have the undead special rule. Uh, they basically are suffering from the, uh, they have the animated construct rules. They also create fear and they also have unstable rules as well. And they must be within 12 inches of an army general or within six inches of a wizard with the lore of necromancy if they wish to march. The vampiric special rule still applies for vampires. They cause fear and have immunity to psychology. And also any successful to wound rolls against them must be re-rolled. Unless of course the attack is either a magical attack, a flaming attack, or a successful killing blow. Now we have a really quick update for the Red Thirst. Originally in the 8th edition of Warner Fantasy Battle, you had to roll a 6-up in order to regain a single wound that you lost. In this case now it's improved up to a 5-up roll, so that part's kind of cool. However, this does not work against animated constructs, demons, force, spirits, uh, units, so that's how they kind of create that uh, exchange there. At the same time, we also have Generals of Undeath. Uh, your army's general must be a wizard and must use the lore of Rec necromancy, so that's also there as well. We have our Slay General Rule, where basically you have to take your leadership test for crumble checks. That's remained the same. However, if at the start of any of your following turns, though, the Death Wizard of a wizard of a, of a General, you have a wizard of some sort who knows Lord Necromancy, they don't need to worry about taking those rules. Now, Resurrecting Falling Warriors have relatively stayed the same, so no major change there, as well as Battle Standards, however, has made a huge difference on this one. As it says, it says, in addition to the normal rules for the army battle standard, units of undead within 12 inches of their battle standard suffer D3 wounds less than they normally would due to unstable special rules. So, once again, actually might be actually worth getting a battle standard bearer for your army now. Uh, traditionally, that was not necessarily the case, but with that D3 though, that might be something you might want to look at. So that being said, let's go ahead and move on to our individual units now. So first of all, we have vampires, and we've actually have a throwback to the older edition of Warhammer Fantasy. We have four main bloodlines of vampires once again. We have the Van Karnsteins, who are the rulers of Sylvania. They're back as well. They have their stats located here thusly, and of course, they're also wizards. We have our Necrarch vampires, which are basically your magic-focused bloodline of wizards as well. So they can actually take lore of metal. They can also take lore of heavens, lore of shadow, or lore of death. So 
That's pretty neat. We have Blood Dragon Vampires, which are more of your combat-oriented vampires. Uh, they can take Lord of Necromancy, Shadow, or as well as Death. They also have their Martial Honor Rule, which means they must always issue and accept challenges. We have our Lamian Vampires. They're back as well. These are the very fast and quick fighting ones. They have Lord of Shadow as well as Lord of Death for their wizards as well. And of course, we have the good Ostrogoi Vampires, which are like the uh, Ghoul Kingdom Vampires. They can actually use Lord of Necromancy or they can use Lord of Beast. So very interesting there. They also have armor piercing as well uh, given to them as a rule, which is pretty cool, as well as hatred. Uh, personally, Strigoi have always been my favorite version of the vampires. Um, that's just me. So continuing on, of course, we have our necromancers. Those guys are still, you know, the very same as they have been before. They also have their master of, of, of the death upgrade. So that's there. But a new addition to our lore choice now are lich lords. So these are actually really, really cool. And this actually harkens back to the day of... Um, older editions of Warhammer Fantasy. In the fourth edition of Warhammer Fantasy, which was the edition I got into, liches were actually kind of like a combination of combat wizards. They could fight pretty well and at the same time cast magic. As you can see there, they pretty much kept that in line. So we still have our Master of the Dead, so now that's automatically given to them. And at the same time, they can use Lord of Death or Necromancy. But if you look at their stats though, they have Strength 5, Toughness 5, 4 Wounds, and 2 Attacks. So they're actually pretty good as fighters if you have to. So if you're looking for something that's kind of like a happy compromise between fighting as well as having a wizard, a Lich Lord actually might be in it for you. And actually, we'll talk about this in the army list, they can actually ride uh, Mortis Engines, which is really, really cool as well. So moving on, we have our White Kings. White Kings have remained relatively unchanged, so they're exactly the same as before. Same thing with Skeleton Warriors. Uh, that's also the same group with them. They're pretty much the same as always. Zombies, however, got a little bit of an improvement on this one. They actually got a little bit of a buff on this edition. Originally, they were Weapon Skill 1. They're now Weapon Skill 2 in this case, so not as painful as before. They still have their newly uh, Undead rule attached to them as well. And at the same time, they lost their Always Strike Last ability, so that is no longer the case. Always Strike Last does not impact zombies. But then again, with Initiative 1, though, that's not going to be much of an issue with them figuring out how to fight. But, you know, at the same time, though, it is kind of interesting that they've done that. Now, for Crypt Ghouls. Crypt Ghouls got nerfed a little bit. As you can see, their weapon skill now is weapon skill 2 now, so they're not as effective as they used to be in close combat. They still have their 4 up toughness and their 2 attacks, but... With the buff for poison attacks, meaning plus one to wound now, that kind of balances out a little bit, so I can understand the bullet change on that one. I'm not too concerned about that. Now, we have a brand new unit called Sylvian Peasant Levy. These guys are infantry forces. As you can see, they pretty much have the same stats as um, Dregs do from Mordheim, which is actually kind of cool on this one. Weapon skill two, plus a skill two, three strength and toughness, one wound, three initiative, one attack, leadership five. These guys are also expendable as well, so if they die, it doesn't affect anybody. However, you can only take uh, Peasant Levy, however, if you have um, a Vound Karnstein Vampire as your general. The nice thing about these guys is they can actually take missile weapons, so it's actually kind of nice because you can have some shooting elements in your army now for once, which is actually interesting. Dire Wolves are still uh, as relevant as they always have been with Vanguard rules as well as Slavering Charge, so they're still exactly the same. We have Fell Bats. They haven't changed at all except now on the army list. Originally, Fell Bats were special choices. They have been now moved to Core Choice, which is absolutely fantastic because in 8th edition, you only have, I think, like four different choices for your Core Choices. That has now changed with Fell Bats and same thing with Bat Swarms. They have also been moved to your uh, core choices as well, which is really, really nice because that kind of diversifies your core requirements for your army. So that part is super cool. Uh, Graveguard have remained exactly the same as they always have with Killing Blow as well as their stats, so no major change there. Same thing with Black Knights. They're exactly the same way as they have been before, so no change in their stats or their special rules there as well. Corpse Carts, however, has had a huge significant change on this one, and let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So for the random attacks, they've actually increased the random attacks. I believe originally it was D6 random attacks, I believe. It's now been increased to 2D6, and Vigor Mortis has taken a huge role as well. All friendly skeleton warriors and zombie units within 6 inches or uh, of one or more Corpse Carts gain plus one attack. So that buff has been changed as well. In addition, uh, zombie units within 6 inches of a zombie cart gain the regeneration 6 up special rule. So, Vigor Mortis has changed. They've taken away that always strikes first and replaced with that rule, which I think is a much more helpful rule for your, for your zombies as well as for your skeleton warriors. 
as well as you can see here, uh, we pretty much still have our same Bellfire, minus one to enemy modifiers for casting. We still have our Unholy Lodestone, which means that uh, Friendly Wizard within six inches of Unholy Waterstone successfully cast Invocation to Heck. They can reroll a single D6 to determine how many wounds are generated. So that part has still remained the same. So that's pretty cool. Moving on to Crypt Horrors at the same time, Crypt Horrors have pretty much remained unchanged. Um, so they're still pretty much the same as they were before. Same thing with Vargeist, they actually have the same thing as well. Um, their rules have relatively stayed the same. Same thing with Vargulfs, they've done exactly the same thing with these guys. Um, they still have their Hatred, Red Thirst, Regeneration, and Vampiric ability. They still have their Bestial Fury, so they haven't really changed all that much. Now what we do have though is a brand new unit called Lamian Handmaidens, and these characters are Skirmisher Vampires. As you see, they got weapon skill five, ballista skill four, strength four, uh, sorry, strength five, toughness four. They have one wound, two attacks, initiative is six. So they're very, very quick. They have skirmishers. They're also vampiric, and they're also equipped with asp bows, which is a, three, a 30 inch range, strength four, multiple wounds of two attacks when they hit something. They also have poison attacks. They also have sniper rules. So these uh, handmaidens can be extremely deadly, especially if you want to do some character sniping with these weapon attacks. And that's exactly what you should use them for because that's pretty deadly that blood knights are relatively stay the same so we don't have any really significant changes there for your blood knights spirit hosts are exactly the same way as before not much change for the most part for your spirit hosts so that part's kind of neat hex rates however did get nerfed a little bit let's go on and talk about that real fast so for your hex rates um what is happening is that they still cost her they're still ethereal still fast cavalry Still doing that. Their Soul Reaper abilities are still flaming magical attacks that ignore armor saved. And they still maintain their Soul Striders, where they can move through unengaged enemy units or friendly units, but they can't end within one inch of another unit. But their Spirit, I believe it's called Spirit Hunter's ability, where they can attack as they sweep through, that's been eliminated. Which is kind of a sad thing because, you know, mm, balance. Uh, someone basically put the balance argument on that one. So they took away that, which is kind of sad because that was a really cool ability that they had. I'm kind of see to see that go, but you know, them's the breaks, I suppose. So continuing on, we have Karn Wraiths. Karn Wraiths are still very much uh, the same as they had before with their Chill Grasp ability, as well as their stats. So not much change is taking place there. Tomb Banshees have remained relatively the same as well with their Ghostly Howl ability. Um, they also now have this new Hover Rule attached to them, so that's actually kind of interesting. So relatively the same, and they actually kind of buffed them up a little bit, which is kind of neat. Now, of course, we have a brand new unit now called the Morngulls. Now, these were originally from Forge Worlds, what these were. These were monsters from Forge World. Well, now they're including the Vampire Accounts book for, eighth ed for ninth edition. Movement 6, 5 weapon skill, 5 strength and toughness, 4 wounds, 2 initiative, 4 attack, 5 leadership. They have ice attacks, which is pretty cool, and as well as killing blow and the undead special rule. We have the Hunter of the Dark special rule, which means they have a four war save against non-magical attacks, so very tough. And we have Carnophage as well, which says for every unsaved wound the Morgul inflicts in close combat, it regains one wound as is previously lost in the battle. So very, very nice, very, very hard hitting and very quick, which is extremely awesome on that part. So that is really cool to see that. And of course we have the Black Coach as well. They've actually made a little bit of improvements for the Black Coach. It's got a four ward save now. So that part's kind of neat. The Invocation of Death abilities is still pretty much the same. We got plus one for the impact hits for their first one. We also have uh, Nightmares at plus one strength. We also have Nightmares having Killing Blow and Flaming Attacks. We also have Magic Resistance 2, Ethereal Special as well as Flying. So these actually stack up pretty nicely for this. Not to mention, if you were to use the Warhammer Age of Sigmar Black Coach, for your miniature, it'll actually look really, really sick. I mean, that's a pretty cool looking miniature. And that's coming from me. I like to buy my miniatures on the cheap, but that one is pretty cool looking, all things considered. Now, of course, we have the Mortis Engine. Mortis Engine has relatively stayed the same for the most part with the Reliquary rules, as well as his random attacks with the Spectral Steeds and Terror and Undead. The Blasphemous Tome has, rel has relatively stayed the same as well. So no change there, which is kind of nice. Same thing with the Coven Throne. Exactly the same th situation there. That's relatively stayed unchanged for the most part, so that's pretty epic too. Uh, Terror Geist, I've also re relatively made the same as well, um, with its Death Streak ability, and with its 2d6 plus its number of wounds. We do have the Infested as well as Ransom Maw upgrades, which I believe has pretty much stayed the same since the last edition, so that part's kind of great. So no harm, no foul there as well. And same thing with Zombie Dragons. Now, the difference though with Zombie Dragons in this one 
it's relatively stay the same in terms of their stats, so no concern there. But the nice thing about zombie dragons, though, is that you can actually take zombie dragons by themselves. In the previous edition of Warhammer Fantasy, the only way you could take a zombie dragon is if it served as a mount for a character, which is a heck of a lot of points. But now you can just take the zombie dragon just by itself. Uh, as an actual rare choice. So I think that is super cool because zombie dragon miniatures have always been kind of cool looking and just to put on the battlefield by itself makes your army have a lot more different options, also makes it much more flexible, which is always a good thing as well. Now, we have a brand new unit called the Necrofix Colossus, which is absolutely cool as well. Basically, it's an undead construct. Uh, let's take a look at his stats. It's got movement six, weapon skill three, six strength, six toughness, six wounds, one initiative. It's got a special attack. We'll talk about that in a second. Leadership 8. It's got magical attacks, a 4 regen save. It's also got the undead special rule. We have the Vortex of Death, which means that any wizard attempting to cast spells from the Lore of Death or the Lore of Necromancy receives more than 12 inches. Other Necrofex gets plus 1 to their casting roll. Very, very cool rule update. And we also have special attacks for the Necrofex as well, uh, Necrofex as well which you do instead you roll a d6 and you consult the table. You have Batter and Slash, which basically have d6 plus 1 random attacks. You have Impale, which kind of acts like a bolt thrower. What it does that whatever one model base contact, all units, and then that file must take an initiative test or suffer a strength 7 hit with multiple wounds, d6. So very cool. And it's also got Screams of the Damned, which means that the Nicker effects can actually make a Death Streak ability, just like a Terror Geist. And it's also got upgrades as well. You can purchase size and barbs, which means that the uh, number of random attacks can be re-rolled if you don't like the first result. We have Corpse Killers, which means that the uh, Necrofix actually has dead things inside of it that attack that cause D6 strength 2 hits. We got Vampiric Blood, which means that it gains a 3 up on its regen save, and it's also subject to the Berserker Rage part of Frenzy. And you have Dark Soul, which means that it's actually possessed by a Necromancer or a Vampire. It's a level 1 wizard who uses the Lore of Death or the Lore of Necromancy from that as well. It also says if it miscasts, it loses a point of toughness by 1. So, that is very cool. Undead mounts for this one, um, skeletal seeds, exactly the same thing, but now we have a barrow chariot, which is really cool. Which is brand new to this, you could actually have a chariot now for your character, and it's also a spectral steed, so it can still fly through walls, which is very cool. Nightmares have remained the same, same thing with hell steeds, and of course, abyssal terrors, we have those guys again, they relatively stay the same as well. And with that being said, we now move on to the special characters. All right, so let's go and talk about the special characters now, and there are quite a few of them on this one. So we have Vlad von Karnstein, the first Count of Slovenia. Uh, his stats, as well as his rules, have relatively stayed the same, so not too worried about that as well. As you can see, he's got his vampiric powers there. Same thing with his magical items that he has. Isabella von Karnstein has remained the same. Same thing with Manfred. Uh, he's relatively the same as well, so not much change taking place there. Um, However, there is one major difference. There was an addition in the 8th edition where you could take Manfred von Karnstein before he became so powerful. That option is no longer available. You just take Manfred as he is in terms of his maximum power. That's what he basically has for his maximum choice there. And Comrade von Karnstein is still exactly the same way with his mad blood count abilities and you know his close combat very much kid out for fighting. So he's relatively stay the same as well. However, we start seeing some special characters now from the other... Um, bloodlines as well. So we have Neferata. She's back again. As you can see, she's got pretty good stats. Weapon skill 7, Blissa skill, strength and toughness of 5 each, 3 wounds, 9 initiatives. So she is wicked fast with 5 attacks as well. Level 3 wizard who can take spells from Necromancy, Shadow, or Death. She's got Shadow Blood, which is a unique spell that's dedicated to her. It's a magic missile with a range of 24 inches. And it says, when cast, Neferata makes declare how many wounds she is using to boost the effects of the spell. The spell causes D6 strength 5 hits with the flaming attack special rule, plus an extra D6 hitch for each wound Neferata expends, so she could actually lose some wounds to make it more powerful. In addition, using suffering from one or more wounds from this spell must immediately take a panic test, so that one's pretty cool as well. She's also got the Red Thirst and Vampiric Rule. She's got Queen of Lamia, so because of that, Neferata must be the army general. In addition, units of Lamian handmaidens may be included as special units rather than rare units. And she's a heavenly creature, which means that enemies suffer a minus two to her leadership. She's also got lightning reflexes, quick blood, and seduction. And we'll talk about those when we get to the vampiric abilities. She still has the Jagger of Jet, which is basically made in that she's got plus one strength with poison attacks. She's also got the Ruby of uh, Lamia, 
which basically says that at the end of the game, if Nefra is still alive, the Ruby of Lamia automatically lets her regain one wound that she lost during the battle. So that's pretty cool as well. At the end of each turn, sorry, not the end of each game. Uh, we also have the Staff of Pain, and basically what that means is that when Neferata successfully casts a Magic Missile, Direct Damage, or Hex Spell, each Togger suffers D3 additional Strength 5 hits after the spell effect has been resolved. So, very much offensive as well. And then, of course, we have Bastet, her cat. And it says, at the beginning of each of the turns, Neferata can send Bastet to enemy enemy unit in the battlefield within 12 inches. Place a marker of that black cat next to it, and so basically it says here the target unit will be affected by miserable bad luck and everything that can go wrong will. The unit must reroll any successful armor saves it takes while under the Bla uh, Bastet's influence, and this lasts for the duration of the vampire player's turn. So, very, very deadly, that character. And of course, we have our Necroc characters. We have Zacharias the Everliving. He was the wizard who was riding a zombie dragon. So he is back again. As you can see, he's got his excellent stats there. Weapon skill 6, strength and toughness 5, 3 wounds, 3 attacks, and a zombie dragon to boot. Level 4 wizard, and he can actually use spells from the Lord of Necromancy or any of the 8 lores except for life. Can't take that one. So, his vampiric powers are Dark Alkalite, Forbidden Lore, Master of the Black Arts, so very impressive there. He's got the uh, Staff of Kaphamon, which is a balance spell level 4, which contains the Gaze and the Gas spell. He's got a Circlet of Rathek, which is a 4 of Ward save. He's got the scrolls of Simtep, a Simtep, which is the uh, basically the rules for a dispel scroll. And afterwards, the first time you have used one on a roll of d6 on a two up, you can use a scroll the next turn as well. The second time you use one, you may roll three up, four up, all the way up to six up as always. So, very powerful anti magic character, which is kind of cool. And he's also got the book of Nagash, which basically allows him to spell uh, cast invocation to heck at a 24 plus. And the reason why is because it affects all units within 24 inches. So. They don't call him the Everliving for nothing. That guy is a beast. And of course, we have Melchior the Ancient, another Necrack uh, a vampire uh, special character as well. Uh, weapon skill 6, strength, toughness 5, 3 wounds, 3 attacks, initiative 6. Level 4 wizard, Lord of Necromancy. He's got Dark Acolyte, Forbidden Lore, as well as Nekahara's Noble Blood. He's got Fly, Frenzy, Stupidity, as well as the Red Thirst ability. He's got his weapon, Plane Bringer. Uh, basically, whenever he rolls a 6 wound to wound, uh, that uh, attack has multiple wounds, D6, a D3 special rule. So, very, very impressive there. He's got the Grimoire of Necronium. This book allows Me uh, Melchior to cast Invocation Neck as its base value without using any Paradise. Each time you use the book, roll D6 on a roll of 1. It runs out of power and cannot be used for the remainder of the battle. And he's got the Black Cloak of Lamia, which basically means enables it to be targeted by uh, not is unable to be targeted by non-magical shooting attacks. So this guy is very, very dangerous, especially since he is running upon a abyssal terror. So that makes him very, very cool as well. So that is some of the main characters that we have so far. So another character that we have is Sethep the Merciless, who's another Necroc vampire as well. As you can see, his stats are pretty mediocre. Weapon skill 5, 5 strength, 4 toughness, 2 wounds, and 2 attacks. He's a level 2 wizard who can use the lore of necromancy or the lore of death as well. He has Fear Incarnate and Nekahara's Noble Blood. He's got the Red Thirst and Vampiric special rule. And he's got the Staff of uh, Rakomon, I believe is how you pronounce that. It's a balanced spell level 4. The Staff contains the Hellish Vigor special a spell from the lore of necromancy. Roll a d6. Each time the staff is used on a roll of 1, the staff is temporarily exhausted and loses its spell power for the rest of the battle. In addition, all enemy models within 6 inches of the staff's bearer suffer a minus 1 penalty on their rolls to hit in close combat. So, kind of a nice little buff character, kind of like a hero uh, level special character. Now, on to the Blood Dragon special character. So we have Valak Harkon, Grand Master of the Blood Knights. This guy is your infamous close combat, uh, combat kitted out vampire count. Weapon skill 9, 5 strength, 5 toughness, 3 wounds, 5 attacks, initiative 7. He's on a nightmare. He's also got a level 2 wizard with the spells and lore of necromancy. He's got Dread Knight, Doom Rider, and Warrior Pride for his uh, vampiric powers. He's also got Martial Honor as well as Hatred of the Empire special rules attached to him as well. Now, he's also got the Grand Master of the Blood Knights, and that means if Volok is including your army, you may take units of Blood Knights as special units rather than rare units, so that's kind of interesting. So for our magic items, we have the Crimson Blade. The Crimson Blade automatically wounds on a 2-up in addition to see what additional effects the attack has. Um, compare the chart below for each 2-wound die roll with the tail below. So the number of dice you roll, you have Arm Wound, which means that the model loses one attack. A chest Wound 
cause D3 wounds or beheaded, which means it got her rare killing blow. So very deadly that guy. And he's also got a Volok's Bloody Halberk, which is magic armor, full plate armor, so the Volok's Bloody Halberk gives him a 5 board save as well. He's also got the Blood Chalice, which is an enchanted item. And it says at the beginning of each Vampire Count's turn, Volok can drink from the Blood Chalice, allowing him to do one of the following, heal one wound or gain an extra attack, or coats his sword with the blood which bursts into flames. Malak of Volok may reroll ones to hit and to wound and gains a flaming attack special roll as well. And it says the last two effects last until the uh, start of the next uh, Vampire Count's turn. And of course we have the Blood Dragon Standard. This is the army's battle standard. All Blood Dragon Vampires and Blood Knights within 12 inches gain the Hatred Special Rule. So this guy is very much kitted out for combat and for inspiring other Blood Dragon Vampires. Then we have the Red Duke, the Scourge of Aquitaine. Uh, weapon skill, uh, movement 6, weapon skill 8. 5 strength and toughness, 3 wounds, 5 attacks. Level 1 wizard from the lore of necromancy. He's got the heart piercing as well as honor or death and red fury special rules. Hatred of Bretonia as well. He's also got his martial honor which means he must always declare challenges. He has gold and death, his weapon. It's two, hand we uh, two hand weapons. The sword gives the red duke plus one strength and plus one hit in close combat. He's also got the armor of blood which is a full plate armor and the armor of blood allows the red thirst to regain wounds automatically for every wound so no roll is necessary. So pretty good combat lord there as well. And now we got the Strigoi special character Gashnag, the Black Prince, uh, weapon skill 7, strength 5, toughness 5, 3 wounds, 5 attacks, initiative 7. He's a level 2 wizard from the lore of death or necromancy. He's got infinite hatred as well as iron sinews. So he's got plus 1 to his strength, making him strength 6. He also causes multiple wounds, d3 for his attack, as well as armor piercing 1. Very deadly there. He's also got the cloak of the Strigos and basically gives him a water save of 5 up. In addition, enemies targeting him in close combat with missile attacks and with missile attacks suffer a minus 1 to hit. And of course, we've got our normal special characters, Heinrich Kimmler. He's relatively stayed the same since the last time we looked at him, so we're not going to really worry about him too much because he's pretty much the same as before. Same thing with Krell. Krell has relatively stayed the same as well, so not major changes for that character too much as well. However, we do see the return of Dieter Hellsnick, the Doom Lord of Middenheim. I haven't seen this character since the fourth edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. This guy was interesting because he was actually a necromancer combat character, if you can believe it. So let's go and talk about this guy real quick. So, first of all, he rides a mana core, so that tells you everything you need to know about him. He's got weapon skill 4, 4 strength, 4 toughness, 3 wounds, as well as 1 attack. He's also level 4 wizard, and he uses spells from the lore of necromancy and or lore of death, and he can freely choose which one he wants from both lore, so very, very impressive. Like I said, combat kitted out necromancer. The Manticore, of course, has his special rules, and he's also got his Doom Lord ability, which means that Dita does not need to test for Berserk Rage from his Manticore's Frenzy, so he can actually control that creature pretty good. What makes him a combat lord for the most part, though, is his uh, Chaos Rune Sword. He gets plus one to his weapon skill, plus one to his strength, making him strength five, and plus one to his attacks as well. He's also got the Rod of Flaming Death, and uh, it says, go ahead and see the art at Artifacts of Death. We'll talk about that in a second. And he's got a Power Scroll. One use only, the bearer can use the scroll to cast one of his spells at his basic power level automatically without using any power dice. It can be dispelled as normal. So very cool there. And then we have Helmand Gorst, he's another special character. Uh, he basically rides a, uh, a, a corpse cart, he's also got the Brothers Gorst who pulls it as well. Weapon skill 3, strength, toughness 3, 2 wounds, 1 attack. A level 2 wizard, he uses the spells in Lord Necromancy, he's got Awaken the Dead from the Grave. When Helmand Gorst successfully casts the Invocation of Heck Dead spell, he can add D3 to the number of skeletons or zombies created, so that's what he has. And he's also got the Libra Noctis, which gives him a plus one power die in each of his magic phases, which only he may use. So a very powerful hero level character there as well. So the special character is over with. Let's go and talk about magic as well as magical items. All right, so let's go and talk about the lore of necromancy. It's no longer the lore of vampires anymore. It's called the lore of necromancy. And to be perfectly honest with you guys, it's pretty much the same as what you guys are used to seeing for uh, all the spells. Invocation of the Hex is pretty much the same. Raise the Dead is also the same as well. Same thing with Van Hell's Dance for Cobb, Hell's Vigor. It's all pretty much the same. So we're not going to spend too much time to, on this one. Um, we're just going to move on from there because the effects are relatively the same. What's really big, however, now is vampiric powers. Now we have some general vampiric powers. 
like Red Fury, which is worth 35 points, but it's also restricted on what kind of vampires can take him. So, for example, Red Fury can only be taken by Blood Dragons or Strigoi, for example. Fear Incarnate can only be taken by Van Star and Croc Blood Dragons or Strigoi, so Lamians can't take them. And as you see here, they have a variety of different effects um, and also point values as well. Uh, Supernatural Horror, for example, can only be taken by Varian Karnstein, Necroc, or Strigoi, which means they cause terror, for example. We have Curse of the Revenant, which can only be taken by Necroc or um, Strigoi only. It gives him a 4-up regen save. It doesn't give him the plus 1 win anymore. We have Flying Horror, Transfix, Unbending Willpower, Honor or Death. So you can see we have all these additional new things that we have as well. And we also have very specific uh, Von Karnstein, Necroc, as well as Vampiric powers based on your bloodline. So for example, the R of Dark Majesty, which gave you a minus one penalty to enemy leadership, uh, is only a Van Karnstein power now. We also have Walking Dead, we also have Call Winds, Summon Creatures of the Night, Wolf Form, we also have Wolf Lord, so that way your Dire Wolves get some bonuses to that as well. We also have your Necrock uh, abilities, which gives you your uh, magical abilities for the most part. Like I said, we can spend all day on this, but we're just doing a quick little run through real fast. Which is actually kind of neat. So once again, giving them bonuses to their spells. Nekahara's Noble Blood gives you a plus one to cast spells. So that's another uh, uh, another buff that you get from that, which is very interesting as well. We have, of course, Blood Dragon abilities. Uh, Doom Riders, for example, the model in the cavalry units with it can reroll fill charge reactions. Dread Knight, Heart Piercer, Master Strike. As you can see there, we got all these additional uh, new Bloodline rolls that we use for them. Same thing with Strigoi. We have Massive Monstrosity, gives you plus one to your wound. Uh, iron sinews plus one strength. So as you can see there we have some really interesting ones. This one I really like this one as well. It says ghoulkin, which is worth 10 points One unit of crypt ghouls can be deployed as scouts. If you have a huge unit of ghouls um, You could put a horde of these guys right within scouting distance of your opponent Which could be absolutely terrifying if you're not careful. So that's actually kind of a cool uh, little ghoul set there The the potential for that one is, in, is very interesting and of course, you have Lamia uh, special rules as well. We have Seduction, we have Lightning Reflexes, which allows you to reroll hits in close combat. Night Creature, Quick Blood, which means you have a Dodge 5 0 special rule. It no longer gives you Always Strike first, so that's kind of sad. But we also have Swiftness, though, and Beguile and Innocence Loss and stuff. So we do have some uh, rules here, like Innocence Loss, for example, gives you Always Strike first instead. So that's kind of cool there, which is nice. Now we also have our artifacts, of course. We have the Frost Blade, which is brand new to this. It basically says wounds from the Frost Blade. They are uh, if uh, if a model suffers one or more wounds from the Frost Blade after saves, they are slayed outright and uh, lose all remaining wounds. Very powerful magic ability on that one. Unfortunately, though, I like to run Strigoi when I play Vampire Counts, but Strigoi can't use magical weapons in this edition, so. That's kind of sad. Scavsgrath was like one of my favorite ones to put on a uh, Ghoul King, but I can see why they did that. You also have your Night Shroud ability, Black Parafat, Staff of Damnation. These are all relatively stay the same for the most part in most cases. Cursed Book is still there. Same thing with Banner of the Barrows and Screaming Banner, which is really, really cool. The Screaming Banner has actually changed a little bit. Before, um, with this one it says enemy units and base contests. Carrying this banner must pass the leadership test at the start of each close combat phase. And if it's failed, though, they require a 6 to hit for the duration of the phase. So it's a little bit different, but this could be really used to help out your Skeleton Warriors or any other unit that uses Screaming Banner, which is kind of cool as well. And of course, we have a Rod of Flaming Death, the Book of Archon. Those have stayed relatively the same for their magic items as well. So with the magic item is over with, the next thing we're going to take a look now is the Vampire Counts Army List. All right, so up next, we're going to talk about the different army lists now. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So first of all, of our lords, as you can see, we have all of our lords located here as well, as well as their point values. Uh, so for example, Manfred von Karnstein, for example, he can add monsters. He's worth 560 points just by himself. And you can see how he can really just stack up with his mounts alone, which is interesting. We also have Neferata as well. She can actually be mounted up on a Hellsteed or a Coven Throne, which makes him make her even deadlier. So that's actually kind of interesting. We have Melchior, the Ancient, of course. We talked about him. He's already mounted on his uh, Abyssal Terror with 530 points for him. As well as Zacharias, the Everliving. He's already mounted on his Dragon. He's 755 points there as well. So you can see here we have our different point values for our different Lords. All of them are super expensive. Uh, Heinrich Kimmler, I think he went up in points as well, I think. I think he went up by 100 points, if I remember correctly. 
so I actually made him a little bit more expensive. And of course we have Dieter Helsnitsch, which is a cool character. I just like that because it just kind of makes me nostalgic from back in the day. Back when I was a kid, I actually fought against another player who used Dieter Helsnitsch, and he, he made quite an impression on me uh, with his fighting ability, worth 425 points for that character. And of course you got your uh, Von Konstein Vampire Lords at 260, Nekark Vampire Lords at 260 as well, Lamian Vampires at 250, uh, Blood Dragons at 260 there. Your Strigoi Vampire Lords are at 240. However, for them though, they may not take magic weapons. So that part is no longer part of uh, their availability. However, it looks like they might be able to take magic armor though. So that's kind of cool. Before in the last edition, they could take magic weapons if they wanted to. They just couldn't take magical armor. But now it looks like they've kind of gone reverse. So, you know, the Strigoi Vampire Lord has some pretty good combat abilities just on his own. So he may not necessarily need um, magic weapons to help him out. And of course you got your Nasser Necromancer. They have their various steeds that they can ride up as well. As well as your Lish Lord, which is really cool. I like that they included a Lish Lord because he's kind of like a happy medium. And like I said before, this guy could actually ride on a corpse uh, on, a, on a mortis engine, which is really cool as well. And take a Blasphemous Tome upgrade. So very, very cool option for that one. Same thing with the Barrow Chariot. I think that's really cool that they actually brought that in so that way you can ride a chariot in combat if you want to. So very cool there. Now for heroes, we have Isabella von Karnstein as well as Conrad. They've been reduced down to hero choices. We have Sipheth the Merciless, Krell as well as Helm and Gorse. So those are our named characters. We also have our uh, generic von Karnstein, Nekrark as well as Lamian and Blood Dragon and Strigoi heroes, which is actually kind of cool as well. So uh, definitely could use that, have a Strigoi Vampire, for example, use that Ghoulkin ability to put him in a unit of four unit of ghouls and have him sneak attack somebody. That could be actually kind of fun if you wanted to do that. And of course, we've got our hero level Necromancers, as well as our Right Kings that can be used as army battle center bearers. It doesn't look like you can have Vampiric battle center bearers, it looks like. Yeah, you can't have Vampiric uh, battle center bearers. So it just looks like your White Kings are the only ones that can do that. So, eh, more's the pity. And of course, you got your Karn Rice there as well. Now, let's go ahead and talk about our core requirements. As you can see, your Skeleton Warriors now are four points per model. At the same time, they can also take Spears and Halberds now. They can take Bows too, as well as Crossbows. So you can actually have Shooting Elements once again in your Vampire Counts army. So that is a huge, huge thing that's actually really cool in this one. You can actually have that as well. Now, they do have a notation here. It says you may have more uh, models of Skeleton Warriors armed with bows or crossbows than you have uh, with Skeleton Warriors without them. So you have to actually have like a one for one. So for every Skeleton Warrior unit that has shooting ability, you have to take a one that doesn't. I'm not sure why you need that. I know, actually, I know why you need that. Because some person's out there is like, yeah, balance, Commander Chief Skate, you need it for balance. Yeah. Okay, whatever. I'm not sure why that is necessarily the case. It's like, why? Is there like some magical spell that when you raise these guys from the dead that, no, 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 you have to have at least two regiments of skeletons when you raise them from the dead to have one with weapons and one with bows because magical reasons, I, I don't get that. You know, just come on, man. Just take that out and just, you know, let them have their ranged weapons. They're only ballistic skill too, for goodness sake. I mean, you're not really, you're not going to be able to hit a broadside of a barn with that kind of uh, with that kind of um, with that kind of ballistic skill. But anyways, you could also have a magic standard worth up to 25 points, which could be really useful for putting that screaming banner on them as well. You could also equip them with medium armor too, so you can actually make these guys kind of like quasi grave guard if you actually kid them outright. Then of course we have zombies. They're still miserable. <laughs> we have Crypt Ghouls now. I think they're at, I think they went up a point is what they ended up doing as well. You could also make them into skirmishers, which could be really cool as well, using them as uh, blockers. So that's actually pretty cool right there as well. And like I said before, you can have Sylvanian uh, Peasant Levy for your units as well if you want to put shooting attacks without having to take that one from one nonsense. But the trade-off is though, you must have a Von Karnstein Vampire being your general if that's the case. Dire Wolves, still awesome, still being in the core units as well. And like I said before, Fell Bats and Bat Swarms are now part of core requirements. So that is really, really nice as well. Kind of diversifies your units in the core requirement area, which is really nice. So kudos there. Now for your special units, of course, you have your Grave Guard. Uh, those guys can be encrypted with heavy armor. They all start off with medium armor uh, standard. They can be upgraded with heavy armor, which is kind of cool. They can also take Halberds now 
which is really, really great. Now, with the new rules with great weapons is not as detrimental as it was before, but halberds are kind of nice though because they have an issue of three, which means you can take on most units relatively with ease for most of for most enemies to run into. So that's really cool too. Black Knights, of course, have relatively stayed the same as well. They can also upgrade to heavy armor, make their armor save even better, makes them more survivable. And they can also take Barding too, which is great. Hex Wraiths are also special choices uh, at 27 points apiece now. They're not as expensive as they used to be, but that's because they took away their soul hunting ability, so that was kind of sad. And Crypt Horrors have remained the same for the most part for their stats. Same thing with Corpse Karts and Vars Geists and Spirit Hosts. Those are all in your special unit requirements too. Now, for your rare units, Blood Knights, obviously, they're going to be in your rare choices. That's just the simple way it is. They've also gone down a few points, too. I believe they're originally 50 points apiece, if I remember correctly. So now it's dropped down to 42 points. Uh, Lami and Hindmaidens, they're now part of that as well. They have a unit size of 3+. plus. Uh, they got two hand weapons and light armor. They have their ass bows here as well that they could use. 21 points per person there. Black Coach is also worth 170 points this time. You got your Volgof, which is in this as well or 200 points, so interesting that there is location. And as you can see here, you got your Mortis Engine as well as your Karn Wraiths, and they capped the Karn Wraiths. That part kind of upsets me, I hate when they do that. Um, unit caps to me is like ultimate nerf, in my opinion. If your opponent wants to take maximum amount of Karn Wraiths to max out their rare choices, they should be allowed to do so. Because, like, think about it, you're not ever gonna cap units, not really, if you don't, if you, if you don't have to in real life, but. Like I said, I digress. That's just my personal opinion on things. Tomb Banshees now are now rare choices, which is kind of sad. Before, they used to be hero choices, so you could take several of them if you wanted to. Now, you have to only take one, and you got to go up to 3,000 points to take another one if you want to. Once again, getting slapped around with a nerf bat because of balance. And you got your Morgul's, which are now worth 170 points, which is kind of cool. And you got your Terror Guys, of course. But what I think is the coolest part, though, is that Zombie Dragons can now be taken just by themselves as a rare choice, which I think is very ace there. And of course, we have our Necrofix Colossus worth 240 points with all of your upgrades if you want to as well. So that part is really cool. So there you have it, folks. This is my review for the ninth edition rule changes for vampire accounts for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Overall, I think this is still an excellent resource. Yes, there's some nerfing on some things as well, which I always find upsetting when they really nerf something. But at the same time, though, it's not as bad as it possibly could be. So that's like the redeeming quality on this one as well. This is an excellent resource for vampire accounts with enough new information and new units as well as new rules to make it very, very interesting. It's kind of nice seeing how a um, uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias Eliason has brought back a lot of throwback units as well as a lot of throwback rules and bring them up again into this edition of Vampire and into this edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which is really nice because now the army books you are definitely spoiled for choices now. If you look at almost all the army books within the Warhammer Armies project, there is an endless amount of different choices that you can use. It can you really customize your army and make it very, very interesting looking as well. In fact, there are so many choices now that you don't have to worry about just looking at standard template armies anymore. It's just, it could be whatever you want it to be, which just makes it really, really interesting on that part. And it just makes these vampire accounts look really, really interesting. It's also changed up some things, but makes it kind of fresh and makes it kind of new as well. So my overall opinion, this is an excellent resource and you also can't beat the price, which is free. And that is absolutely fantastic. So if you haven't gotten a chance yet, go down to the Warhammer Armies Project website, download some rules and start playing some Math Edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle because this is looking at like a really good system. And my gaming group and I are really excited to give this a try. So there you have you guys. That's good to do for this one. As always, please feel free to like, comment and or subscribe. Your guys input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.